To be as upfront as we can, the overwhelming majority of this video will be dedicated to the invasion of Ukraine, as since starting this series, no other story, including COVID-19, has dominated headlines quite like this. As a result, we'll first be covering the handful of other stories, letting Ukraine be a single continuous segment, broken into the different dimensions of the war. With this in mind, let's start with something more lighthearted. As we know, over 6 million people have died from COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic, with this month seeing the overall case numbers creeping to approach half a billion. The podium positions for overall cases still remain unchanged, however, it seems as if the United States may have lost one of its coveted titles. The nation of South Korea has overtaken the land of the free, claiming the record for the most amount of confirmed cases in a single day, clocking up over 400,000 on the 15th of this month, and over 600,000 only two days later, smashing the previous record by a large margin. Between these two days alone, nearly 2% of its entire population contracted COVID, which unsurprisingly led the government to revive some of the stricter policies it had employed near the start of the pandemic. Meanwhile, in the United States, it's reported that roughly a quarter of new cases are due to the BA2 variant that we briefly discussed last month. Health officials have affectionately dubbed this the Delta Cron variant due to its superficial similarities to the Delta variant combined with the infectiousness of Omicron. Quite fortunately, it seems as if current vaccines are still effective against this fresh new take on a deadly infection particularly when it comes to preventing severe cases. At this stage, around half the news team has contracted COVID at some time or another, so we can personally recommend minimizing risk when at all possible. This shit isn't fun. Viewers who own a car are likely well aware of the sharp increase in petrol prices this month, with the United States seeing the highest gas prices since those handful of US banks fucked the entire world economy in 2008. Although not quite as high, when adjusting for inflation, this rise is still quite significant, with some estimates predicting that a typical American family could be paying an additional $2,000 this year alone. As simple as it would be to point to one cause in particular for this sharp rise in prices, the current situation appears to be due to a multitude of reasons. Viewers might remember that demand for oil absolutely plummeted near the start of the pandemic, as global lockdowns saw much less of a demand for the average driver. This reached its peak in April of 2020, when the price of US oil actually swung into the negative for the first time, as the cost for producers to store the stuff was higher than paying buyers to take the commodity off their hands. As a result, many oil producers around the world slowed production. 
However, as the global oil market started to return to pre-pandemic demand, production in many areas didn't keep up with this heightened activity. As you've likely already guessed, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has also been a contributing factor. Professional Stegosaurus rider and US President Joe Biden would announce a ban on all Russian oil and gas imports, which as we know, is Russia's main revenue source. Truth be told however, the United States only imports around 10% of its oil and gas needs from Russia anyway, but through the magic of globalization, even making it harder for Russia to sell its raw materials to other countries can have knock-on effects back home. Either way, there didn't seem to be all that much debate on whether to ban Russian oil and energy imports, as the House voted in favor with a vote of 414 to 17. This rise in fuel prices is not at all unique to the United States, with petrol from Norway to Australia getting higher than Snoop Dogg at 20 past 4. It's also worth mentioning that not everyone is suffering through this price spike, with typical public transport enjoyers barely noticing a change, while electric vehicle manufacturers rub their hands together with delight. Although it's predicted that Tesla's share price could increase to an all-time high within the foreseeable future, it seems as if customers who might be wanting to make the move to electric might be shit out of luck. Due to lingering supply chain issues, those who can even afford a new EV are likely to wait months, if not years to break their petrol dependency, and according to a representative from car maker, Honda, 60% of their conventional vehicles are already sold before they even arrive at a dealership. As of time of writing, it's expected that things are likely to get worse before they get better, so viewers who can call in any favors for a ride would be wise to do so now. Although headlines this month were dominated by Ukraine, the nation of Turkey was also experiencing its own invasion, with the enemy being the most appalling of all, this being radical feminists. As has been tradition for the past 20 years, International Women's Day in Turkey was marked with an annual night march, which took place across the country, the largest of which took place in Istanbul's Taksim Square, where thousands of protesters would gather to demand the same outlandish things from previous years. Radical demands such as equal rights, equal pay, and freedom from gender-based violence were all unoriginally demanded from the protesters, as if they hadn't found something else to complain about over the past two decades. All joking aside, it's no secret that Turkey has a gender equality problem, as it currently shares the 68th place with Oman on the gender equality index as of 2019. This might be somewhat surprising, as Turkey has been historically ahead of the curve when it comes to women's rights, giving women the right to vote before many Western nations, laying claim to the first female fighter pilot in 1937, and becoming the 34th country to legalize abortion in 1983. In 2011, the nation even hosted the Council of Europe's Istanbul Convention and became the first of 45 countries to sign the binding agreement against violence against women and domestic violence, regardless of sexual orientation. Ten years later, the nation would then do a pro-gamer move and become the first country to pull out of the agreement. Since President Erdogan took power in 2014, The nation has followed a trend toward Islamic conservatism, a faction that makes up a large portion of the president's voter base and who often considers human rights as Western values that have no place within Turkey. With this push for more traditional Islamic family values, authorities in some cities have issued marriage guides and saying that this piece of literature wouldn't be out of place in the Middle Ages would be an understatement. The guide states that beating women is a good means of conflict resolution, that it's okay for 10-year-olds to get married, and that women should not talk during intercourse, as this could lead to the child developing a stutter. Excuse me, why? This isn't even counting the insane number of women who are killed, with Turkish courts registering 300 cases of femicide in 2020, while another 171 women were killed under suspicious circumstances. There's a worrying trend within Turkey of these official suicides being obvious murder cases, however many aren't treated as such, unless there's enough public backlash over the investigation. The night march, on the 8th of March, saw 38 women detained across the country, with many more being tear-gassed and beaten. 
to disperse the crowds. Actions by police, which might have been more effective if the protesters didn't already have so much practice. According to the Economist's Democracy Index, Turkey has dropped from rank 88th to 103 since 2007 and is only six places away from being considered fully authoritarian. However, we at the Swag News team are problem solvers, which is why we think we could easily solve both women's rights and Turkish democracy in one easy step. As it turns out, Turkey has a disproportionately low score in the metric of civil liberties, much of this stemming from gender inequality, which is why, by simply getting rid of all the women, the nation might be able to bump up its score enough to become a flawed democracy. This would give the country the same classification as both France and the United States, allowing its citizens to finally join the democratic world. Dictators watching are free to subscribe for more easy tips on how to run a country, while those living under a shitty government might be more interested in today's sponsor. As it currently stands, this is now our 25th video sponsored by Surfshark, and just like they've helped us deliver news every single month of the year, they can help viewers break those pesky region locks. Surfshark VPN makes protecting your online privacy and watching prohibited Netflix shows easier than convincing yourself that ordering Uber Eats for a sixth time this week is a good idea and you can rest easy knowing that your privacy will be infinitely more secure than my apartment building that those same delivery drivers seem entirely incapable of finding. Gone are the days of having to watch a scuffed DVD that your uncle bought for a single dollar on his holiday in Thailand. Simply change your location to anywhere you like and appreciate a whole cornucopia of new media to enjoy. Signing up with the code on screen will give viewers an 83% discount. 3 months for free, and viewers who aren't 100% satisfied, can back out in the first 30 days, and get a full refund. Surfshark VPN, it's cheaper than the other ones. Meanwhile, McDonald's is sued for nearly a billion dollars, for its ice cream machine scam, and the former finance minister for Afghanistan, isn't corrupt. Before we get into full troop movements for the Ukrainian invasion, we should probably start by fixing our fuck up from last month. In our last video, we reported on the Snake Island standoff, which was made famous by the Ukrainian border guards, who told a Russian warship to go fuck themselves. In that video, we reported that all 13 border guards were killed while trying to surrender, while Russian media claimed that the island was home to 87 Ukrainian soldiers, who were all subsequently captured. As it turns out, the truth was somewhere in the middle, as although there were only 13 occupants, they were indeed captured by Russian forces. It's currently unclear where exactly they are, as of time of writing, as some believe that they could still be in Russian custody, while others speculate that they could have been part of one of the several prisoner exchanges that have been conducted since the start of the war. This brings us to the war itself, which likely hasn't been tracking the way President Putin would have liked. On the Northern Front, a 64-kilometer Russian convoy was spotted earlier in the month, presumably to remedy its infamously poor logistics situation, which have seen Russian troops short on necessities such as food, ammunition, and fuel. A push for the capital of Kiev would be made from several surrounding cities, however, this would ultimately be repelled by a Ukrainian counter-attack, which would go on to recapture a number of small towns to the east and west of the capital. The northeast on the other hand, has been more successful for the Russian military, as its flat and sparsely populated terrain makes it excellent for tanks and other mechanized forces to thrive. Some experts believe that this would be the most successful angle of attack to make a serious push into Kiev. To the eastern front, the second largest city in the country has remained under the control of Ukraine which is especially impressive when considering it's only 35 kilometers from the Russian border. The city of Mariupol is also closely contested, which made headlines after a Russian airstrike would kill an estimated 300 people gathered inside a theater. Russia would officially deny the attack. To the south, Russian forces would capture Kherson, marking the first major Ukrainian city captured during the invasion. Feeling lucky, this force would then attempt to capture Mykolaiv, two days later, only to be stopped, and later repelled by a counter-attack. Ukrainian citizens themselves 
have also made life quite difficult for invading soldiers, with many crafting Molotov cocktails, creating barricades for tanks, and taking down road signs to confuse navigators. Unfortunately, this has led to forced disappearances, hostage taking, mock executions, and cases of sexual violence perpetrated by Russian soldiers. Determining casualties for the war has also proved to be nearly impossible, as everyone seems to have an incentive to underplay or exaggerate specific figures. For example, at around the tail end of March, Russia had reported it had suffered around 5,000 casualties, while the United States estimated around 15 to 22,000, while NATO put the number somewhere between 30 to 40,000. On the other hand, Russia claims that around 14,000 Ukrainian troops have been killed, while Ukraine has reported losses of around a tenth of this number. The truth is that we have no idea how many people have lost their lives in this conflict, and this likely won't be truly known for a long time into the future. As much as troop numbers, training, and logistics have a huge impact on the outcome of a war, we also can't discount the sizable impact of the international community as a whole. In a UN vote on the 3rd of March, 193 member states had their chance to either condemn or support the invasion. However, as we found it was a bit disheartening to list every single country who voted in support of Russian aggression, we thought it would be more appropriate to use the 1993 Yakko's World Song to make things a bit more fun. Viewers should keep in mind that North Korea, Belarus, and Eritrea weren't included in the song, likely as most of them were new countries by the time the episode aired, so we'll just have to put those to the side. With that out of the way, sit back and relax, as we list every country formally in support of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And now, the nations of the world, brought to you by Yakko Warner. Syria. Well, I may have gone too far in a few places. To the relief of both Krusty the editor and the wider world, this list turned out to be laughably short. On the other hand, 141 member states called for the immediate withdrawal of Russian forces, while 35 chose to abstain. In the interest of time, Yakko's world can sit this one out. Sanctions efforts also ramped up over the month of March, with nearly all Russian airlines and private flights being banned from UK, US, and European Union airspaces. The European Union would also ban Russian state-owned television networks from the bloc, which as we touched on last month, was filled with a fair amount of straight-up propaganda. Even the fiercely neutral Switzerland imposed targeted sanctions of Russian companies and individuals, freezing any assets within the nation. South Korea and Japan piled onto the shit show, which mainly targeted financial institutions and the export of key military components, such as semiconductors. The British government would later unveil its biggest sanction package in the nation's history, including asset freezes on both Russian banks and extremely wealthy Russian individuals. Canada would also adopt a targeted approach to 62 Russian elites, as well as prioritize immigration applications for Ukrainians who want to move to the country outright. These sanctions continue with the Czech Republic, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand, but this is all still the tip of the iceberg. At the tail end of February, British multinational company, BP, the single largest foreign investor in Russia, would announce that it would be divesting from Russian state-owned oil company, Rosneft, which comprises around half of BP's oil and gas reserves. That same day, the government pension of Norway, which is the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, would divest itself from Russian assets, totaling around 2.8 billion US dollars. What followed was an absolute avalanche of divestment from the nation, including Shell and some of the world's largest shipping companies, who would cease all shipments outside of essential goods, such as medical supplies, foodstuffs, and humanitarian supplies. Other industries would soon follow the trend of getting the hell out of Russia. Look, Pim, I know it's our job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here? And for the average citizen, this has made doing the simplest of things exceptionally hard. Theoretically, a Russian man named Ivan 
could wake up one day and find out that all of his international packages from UPS, FedEx, and DHL have been cancelled. Sad and defeated, he goes to get himself some comfort food, but finds that McDonald's, Starbucks, Pizza Hut, and KFC are no longer open. Ivan eventually finds a nice restaurant he likes, but because Visa, MasterCard, and American Express have all pulled out, he has to pay in cash, which is now worth around half of what it was at the start of the year. Our theoretical Russian man then tries to buy himself a snazzy new outfit, but with international brands like TJ Maxx and Adidas suspending operation, he might find this endeavor just as frustrating. Defeated, our handsome Russian lad tries to relax, but as he would soon find out, Microsoft, Sony, and Netflix would all be part of the divestment wave and no longer be offering their services within the country. These are only a handful of businesses that have ceased to operate within Russia, and the longer the invasion continues, the longer citizens are forced to become increasingly isolated from the modern, ever-connected world. In response to hundreds of brands pulling out, there have been talks to start nationalizing these assets within the country, meaning the Russian government would simply take everything a company owned within their borders. This does however come with some pretty insane consequences, as obviously no company on the face of the planet would choose to invest in a country which might decide to steal their assets at the drop of a hat. Much like every decision President Putin has made since the start of this war, it has been very carefully and meticulously calculated, but holy shit, is he bad at math. A hotly debated topic in recent years has been the extent to which social media giants should be limiting what's posted on their platforms. With these networks now becoming a kind of infrastructure through which people communicate and discover information, these online platforms have become public settings for anyone to have a voice. In many cases, this has meant that the platforms themselves, and not lawmakers, have become responsible for filtering what should and shouldn't be allowed, and this isn't always an easy call to make. As we've seen recently, some social media sites have begun fact-checking news sources, which although designed to mitigate some of its truly destructive potential, has brought into question who exactly would become the arbiter of truth. Nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. In the modern age, this kind of power, which has seemingly landed into the laps of social media giants, tends to become even more complicated in wartime, as Meta, the parent company to Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, made a temporary change to its content policy this month, allowing users to call for violence upon Russian soldiers. It should be noted that this policy is only specifically allowed in Ukraine, requires the content to be put into context of the war, and prohibits the violence to be directed at any civilians. Russian prosecutors would be quick to respond to this change, branding the US tech giant an extremist organization, and would later restrict access to both Instagram and Facebook. This decision appeared to be a long time coming, as Russia cited 26 cases of supposed discrimination against Russian media since October 2020. Russia's embassy in the US would make a tweet on the decision, saying quote, Users of Facebook and Instagram did not give the owners of these platforms the right to determine the criteria of truth and pit nations against each other. Perhaps the only thing more shocking than the invasion of Ukraine itself was the sheer magnitude of the hypocrisy in that statement alone. As it currently stands, Russian citizens who are accused of sharing supposed fake information of the war can face up to 15 years in prison, which means anything deviating from Putin's bullshit excuse that Russia is liberating Ukraine from being overtaken by Nazis. Even the average Call of Duty campaign is more subtle than this shit. As it turns out, making up excuses for invading a country which have close ties to each other has the potential to backfire when the truth is revealed. Since the start of the invasion, there have been numerous reports of captured Russian soldiers who have become furious when told that the supposed special military operation was indeed an invasion. When asked about why they were there, some Russian prisoners were told that they were simply part of military exercises, while others were assured that they'd be welcomed as liberators, going as far as expecting cheers and flowers. When asked what he would say to his fellow soldiers and Russians back home, one captured officer replied quote, Everything we were told was a fake. I would tell my guys 
to leave Ukrainian territory. We've got families and children. I think 90% of us would agree to go home. Another Russian captive was less eloquent in his response, as when asked what he would tell his commanders in light of the revelation, he simply replied. They are faggots. End quote. According to an advisor of a former Ukrainian prime minister, Russian soldiers are broadly divided into two categories. The first are the career soldiers. These are usually older guys who have fought in Syria or the Donbass regions of Ukraine since 2014. The second category are the younger conscripts, who the advisor describes as quote, scared shitless. These poor motherfuckers were born as early as 2002, meaning some of them weren't even around before Attack of the Clones was released in cinemas. A lot of these guys are fucking teenagers who have no idea why they're even there, sent off to be cannon fodder in a pointless fucking war. In some cases, when Russian prisoners are allowed to ring home to their families, their parents don't even know that they're in Ukraine in the first place, and Ukrainian authorities have opened a hotline for worried Russian relatives for this exact reason. Since the start of the invasion, over 3 million Ukrainians have fled the country, mostly to neighboring Poland, but others have sought safe havens all over the world. By an insane stroke of luck, I stumbled upon one such refugee who ended up in Australia, a young woman named Elizabeth, who was willing to give her experience of the invasion. Elizabeth and her family lived in Kharkov, which is the second largest city in Ukraine, and when looking at a map, is also really fucking close to the Russian border. At 5am on the 24th of February, she was woken up by a call from her mother, telling her about the initial bombing. Hastily packing for an evacuation, their family regrouped at a single household and went out for emergency supplies like food and petrol, with the panic to get into these stores, taking as long as 40 minutes. While at the petrol station, they would witness their local airport being bombed and would later end up spending several hours sheltering in a nearby metro before they could get home. After a rough night of sleep, it was decided that evacuating via train would be the best course of action. Their escape from Kharkov had begun. As Elizabeth's father was a doctor, he decided to stay behind to help those in need, while her grandparents also stayed put due to health concerns. The rest of the family boarded a train headed to Lviv, near the Polish border, but getting there would mean going straight through the capital of Kiev, which Russian forces would actively bomb on their way through. After sitting tight in a train carriage, Filled with three times the recommended number of passengers, they would eventually make it to Lviv before taking a bus into Poland the following day. Since landing in Australia, Elizabeth has been worried about her family, her pets, and her country. Within a week of arrival, she's attempted to find a job to support herself, which has proved to be impossible with her current visa restrictions. The most insane part of this story is that as crazy as it is, it's just one from several million people who have desperately attempted to flee the country, and the majority who are still living, working, and fighting within Ukraine. The human toll this conflict has had on the regular citizens of Ukraine has been outright extraordinary, and even after hearing this story of someone go through so much hardship to uproot their entire life, I can't help think that Elizabeth and her family were some of the lucky ones. On a side note, after letting sheer curiosity get the better of me, I would also show Elizabeth the infamous 5 TikTok dances you can do to help Ukraine fight Russia, to which she would respond quote, I don't see that before, is it for hype, I don't think it's to help the Ukrainians. After extensive research by the entire team, Elizabeth's assumptions would be conclusively proven correct. As you might imagine, not all shots fired in the war over Ukraine came from a gun, which was most evident when the head of Ukraine's anti-corruption agency personally thanked Moscow's top defense official for being so terrible at his job. Head of Ukraine's National Agency on Corruption Prevention, Alexander Novikov, addressed Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu directly, stating that his embezzlement of public funds had made an invaluable contribution to the defense of his country. In the letter, he wrote, quote, Russian means and support resources for the attack on Ukraine were stolen, even before they were accumulated on the border of the two states. 
it's no secret that Russian forces have faced severe logistical challenges since the start of the invasion, with Russian soldiers seen to be asking local residents for food, looting grocery stores, and according to a reporter from the New York Times, being sent with rations which expired in 2002, the same year some of these soldiers were born. There have also been reports that some Russian soldiers were initially only equipped with three days worth of rations, however, we weren't able to verify this particular claim. Corruption is of course a huge fundamental threat to any functional country as it essentially makes it impossible to distribute funds correctly and fill the most important positions with the most talented individuals. We've covered this topic on the channel before, but Russia has proven itself to be notoriously corrupt, with Transparency International ranking it 136th, falling below Kenya, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. With this in mind, Ukraine doesn't exactly score that much better, coming in only 17 places higher. In fact, a huge part of President Zelensky's election campaign was to specifically weed out corruption. However, it appears that despite his best efforts, Ukraine has only managed to climb four places in the international rankings since taking office. Although actively at war, Ukraine's National Agency for the Protection Against Corruption would announce a particularly unique tax incentive, stating that all combat trophies would not need to be declared as part of a citizen's personal income. This will likely most apply to smaller trinkets collected, however, much larger acquisitions were also specifically cited, including military equipment and larger abandoned vehicles, which Ukrainian farmers have made a habit of towing away with tractors. Although there were initially claims that one such farmer had attempted to sell a captured T-72 tank on eBay, this was later discovered to be false. It seems that anyone who might be in the market for a Soviet-era war machine might be waiting a little longer for the opportunity. An underreported dimension of the invasion of Ukraine has been the surge of foreign fighters who have joined on both sides of the conflict. On the side of Russia, these international fighters are almost entirely made up of mercenaries, which have been recruited from both regions in Africa and the Middle East. The bulk of these forces seem to be from Syria, a country which has been the backdrop of a bloody civil war for over a decade, with Russia playing a significant part. Reports vary on how much these foreign fighters are paid for their service, but we found figures ranging anywhere from $400 to $3,000 a month, depending on experience. In almost all cases, this earning potential is significantly higher than Syrian citizens can make locally, and in some cases, actually pays better than low-ranking positions in the Russian army. A much less significant, but more specialized force comes from a private military organization, more specifically, Wagner Group. The group was supposedly founded in 2014 by a Russian lieutenant colonel from the Spetsnaz arm of the Russian military named Dmitry Valerovich Utkin and was initially contracted to protect Syrian oil fields. The name Wagner Group was even named after Utkin's own call sign, which derives its name from German composer Richard Wagner. As innocent as this sounds, this is supposedly because of Utkin's admiration for Adolf Hitler, as Richard Wagner was his favorite composer. Setting the irony of Vladimir Putin's Nazi-based excuse to invade a site, Utkin would later be photographed with Putin in 2016, and many believe that the group serves as a kind of black ops arm of the Russian military, where plausible deniability is of the utmost importance. It's not currently known how large this force has become, as the best estimates we have are for 5,000 troops as of 2017, but these guys have been fucking everywhere. Wagner Group has been involved in Syria, the Donbass region of Ukraine, Libya, the Central African Republic, Sudan, Mali, and even Venezuela. When Vladimir Putin needs something done, but doesn't want any fingerprints, he calls Wagner Group. And these guys have been known to do anything from providing protection for an allied head of state, the training of local fighters, suppressing protests, and even torturing and executing people, if the need arises. It's currently unclear how much of a presence Wagner Group has within Ukraine, as reliable information is near impossible to find. However, according to the Ukrainian military, members of the organization had allegedly orchestrated at least two separate assassination attempts on President Zelensky. 
it's difficult to say just how many foreign mercenaries Russia has deployed overall. As the Syrian president has promised to provide as many as 40,000, Russia has approved around 16,000, while the United States reported that they have not seen an influx of Middle Eastern fighters join the Ukrainian front. This isn't to say that there isn't a significant foreign presence on the side of Ukraine. For obvious reasons, countries around the world are hesitant to join the war themselves, but this doesn't stop them from sending military aid like supplies and equipment, as long as Ukrainian citizens are pulling the trigger. The biggest contributor by far, to no one's surprise, has been the United States, when early in the month, 13.6 billion in military and humanitarian assistance was passed in the House of Representatives, in a one-sided vote of 36 to 69. Beyond financial aid, just because a country can't officially become involved, doesn't mean private citizens can't do so themselves. In many cases, this means humanitarian help, with volunteer doctors lending their skills, but it also means that combat veterans themselves are converging on the war-torn nation. As it stands, Ukraine has an international legion of foreign fighters, which has received around 20,000 expressions of interest to join. The legion is made up of fighters from 52 countries from around the world, with their reasons for joining as varied as the individuals themselves. Many in countries close to Ukraine see the invasion as the first step in a wider Russian campaign, and that if Ukraine falls, so too could their own homeland. This doesn't mean that there aren't a significant number of recruits from outside the continent, with at least 550 Canadians joining Ukrainian forces, enough to form their own official battalion. Among them, is a man being called Wally, who is supposedly the sniper who claims the longest confirmed kill in history, at over three and a half kilometers. Confirming anything about this guy, was nearly fucking impossible, as anything outside of the basics were usually from pretty shaky sources, but even having this guy on the ground, is a pretty terrifying thought, as a Russian soldier. The United States has also confirmed that around 4,000 citizens have joined the International Legion, which appears to be the most of any country, at least officially. US veterans have their own reasons for joining the war, with many citing humanitarian motives, but for many on their way to Ukraine, it's more personal. A large number of these volunteers are veterans, who did tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and many of those either didn't see action, or simply feel more at home in the thick of combat. There's also the fact that many veterans who served in the Middle East have become particularly jaded after those particular conflicts. The invasion of Iraq was predicated on a lie, and even after 20 years in Afghanistan, the nation became the least democratic country on earth as soon as US troops pulled out of the region. In many ways, Russia invading Ukraine is such a black and white conflict in comparison, meaning veterans of these wars see fighting alongside Ukraine as a kind of internal redemption after being left disillusioned by their time in the military. The process of joining the legion of foreign fighters is much more straightforward than you might expect, as the requirements are to just have previous military or law enforcement experience before showing up at a collection point. This becomes a bit more complicated depending on the country however, as although most don't expressly prohibit citizens from serving, they certainly don't recommend it either. In the United States for example, it's legal to become a foreign fighter, as long as it's not for a group who opposes Uncle Sam. However, the Biden administration has strongly discouraged citizens from doing so, instead encouraging Americans to donate to humanitarian organizations. Determining the number of unofficial foreign fighters is also nearly impossible, as in many cases, individuals are simply flying to Poland and crossing into Ukraine on their own. This might be because joining Ukraine's foreign legion requires applicants to sign a three-year contract, which is designed to give individuals the legal protection of the Ukrainian government. Under international law, when a combatant is wounded or captured, they are protected from things like torture, degrading treatment, and cannot be used as hostages, however without these legal protections, they could be shit out of luck. Russian forces have already committed several war crimes since the start of this short conflict, so it stands to reason that they probably wouldn't act too kindly if they captured a random foreign fighter without a flag on their shoulder. With the news concluded, we'd like to make an exciting announcement. 
last month saw our monthly Patreon supporters grow to over 900, meaning as promised, we are letting you the viewers choose what we create next. As of right now, there's a Twitter post open to anyone to make their suggestion on what video idea you'd like us to make, with the one receiving the most amount of likes becoming the overall winner. Suggestions can be as simple as a game review, or news topic, or as complicated as a tier list on traditionally made Mediterranean cheeses, or entirely new formats, like a podcast or Twitch stream. It's your job to vote on what you want, and ask to worry about how the fuck we make it work, and a link to my Twitter will be in the description. Patreon supporters have saved this series outright in the past, but these days, it gives us the luxury of starting super long projects that could take an upward of 6 months to see the light of day and allows us to go above and beyond in what we do. It allows Krusty the editor to make those insane intros. He's a big big fan. Do anime intro. You know, I'd rather not. It's my kid's birthday party. Do anime intro. Brandon the writer to pour through 50,000 pages of boring documents, and Jake the analyst to spend an entire month determining how we can best measure health outcomes for a specific country. We'd love to list some of the projects that are still yet to germinate, but keeping them as a genuine surprise is half the fun. With this being said, there's a good reason you don't tend to see this type of content on YouTube, as covering news with all its dark and controversial topics absolutely kills a channel, as far as the algorithm is concerned. On our second week of this month, the channel generated less than 30 subscribers, under $20 in ad revenue, and under 40,000 views. As we've previously mentioned, supporters and sponsors have shielded us from needing to rely on ad revenue for the most part. However, not being able to generate new subscribers or consistent viewership is a huge problem. We've detailed in the past why we can't just cut out YouTube altogether, and why creating a dedicated channel would make it impossible to meet our sponsor obligations, but this doesn't stop us doing some creative marketing. This is why, if we manage to reach a thousand Patreon supporters, I'll hire a sky banner to fly over a major city to advertise the channel, or to alternatively show another message that you as viewers want in the sky. We are currently 91% of the way there, so viewers who want to help spread the series to people outside of the algorithm can find relevant links down below. As always, we'd like to thank every single viewer for making the series possible, and on behalf of the entire team, we hope you have a happy April of 2022.